Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. The series where I take a book that I bought at a used bookstore and discuss its merits, the things I liked about it, things I didn't like about it, and uh, anything else in between. So, ideally by the end of this uh, video you will know if it fits in the kind of books that you want on your shelf. The title of today's book is Shrinking the Cat by Sue Hubble. The subtitle is Genetic Engineering Before We Knew About Genes. This is a fun, well-researched book about biology and the ways in which we have genetically engineered our, uh, our surroundings. Specifically, the focus is on two different kinds of animals and then two different kinds of plants. It is partially written in a memoir style. It's entirely written in a first-person sense. The author is cataloging their research and the travels involved with it. The preface opens up with the Webster's Dictionary definition of genetics and engineering so that it can set in its thesis what it means when it talks about genetic engineering. It also opens with a quote, which I will read right now. Creation is not an act, but a process. It did not happen five or 6,000 years ago, but is going on before our eyes. Theodosius Dobzhansky, Changing Man, 1968. The first chapter opens with this paragraph and sets the stage for the rest of the writing. We, the namers, call our species, Homo sapiens, the sapient, intelligent, wise sort of human. It is the name by which we distinguish ourselves from all other kinds of life, including those other species of the genus Homo. They, along with Australopithecans, Cro-Magnons, and other relatives of our fine selves, managed to get themselves extinguished somewhere along the line, but we thrived and continued to do so. How wise. The first chapter opens with discussions of maize, and it is the only of the, th the four chapters that focuses on the New World, the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, and that through this plant, over thousands of years, it was developed into something that could be more easily eaten in mass quantities by the people that grew it. How it started out as a small grass and eventually was developed into what it is now, this tall stalk with cobs of so many seeds, hundreds of seeds. It also kind of, for the plants, focuses on the fact that the ancestral breed is lost to history. So as it says, the ancestor of corn is lost in some pre-Incan, pre-Mayan, pre-Aztec past. But a respectable hypothesis that accounts for many aspects of the corn plant has been put forward by Hugh H. Iltis, a botanist at the University of Wisconsin, who conjectures that corn originated 7,500 years ago in Central America as a botanical anomaly when an existing grass had its male parts hijacked by its female parts. It then goes on to discuss the biological side of things. It, you know, it is a research, a long-form research paper, it is in layman terms for the most part, but still wants to teach you about these biological concepts. And so it has on page 25, on 24, a large footnote, thanking the corn refiners association. It follows with the story of silkworms and how this need to genetically modify creatures and plants was partially built out of the economic highways and systems that were being developed as we grew into our own as a species. It discusses how Persians got wealthy off of the trade that was going between the Middle Kingdom, China, and the Mediterranean, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire eventually, and how even Portugal and uh, Spain were so insistent on getting cheaper silk that they were willing to travel west across great oceans just to find any relief that any route that may be cheaper than the overland route that was incredibly 
time expensive. It also discusses how Silk even got out of the Middle Kingdom in the first place, how it was incredibly hard to bring silkworms back to the Mediterranean, especially since they were a nationalized product. The governments of China knew how important maintaining the secrecy of the creation of silk was to its economy. Chapter 3 expands on the development of the cat from the North African wild cat, Felis sylvestris libica, into the modern domesticated cat. How, from all we can gather, it developed as a kind of symbiotic relationship where we had grain. Grain attracted the pestilent rats, and the pestilent rats attracted cats who made entire lives just hunting those rats and in protecting the grain from further destruction by those rats, the humans cultivated those cats, worshipped them, because those cats kept their grain intact. For example, one sentence, For the Egyptians, a household cat was a pet with a hint of the divine, and it would not have seemed at all odd to raise a cat for a talisman and as a sacrifice, a votive offering preserved by ritual mummification. In the wild, those traits that are adaptive for survival and reproductive advantage are brought out through natural selection. So cats, so cats that were fierce, furtive hunters, alert to the snapping of every twig, with coats that gave them good camouflage, would have been favored by evolution. But again, as with corn or silkworms, or dogs or pigs or cattle, for that matter, the traits that suit a cat for a wild life are not necessarily emphasized in artificial selection by humans. And then it gets into a bit of the descriptions of neoteny and how neoteny, I guess, is the other way to pronounce that word, the proper way. How the more juvenile the cat looks, the better it is for attracting attention from humans, and those humans keep it alive. In a way, we accidentally developed them for both ratting and for looking as cute as they do. It also takes the time to discuss how domestication seems to shrink the brains of creatures. This paragraph on page 92. The brains inside the skulls of the Egyptian mummified cats were about the same size as those of the smallest of their wild ancestors. By the Middle Ages, the European cat brain was 10% smaller still the same as the average cat brain of today, except for Siamese cats, whose brains are yet another 5 to 10% smaller. The shrinkage of the cat's neocortex during domestication was matched by the shrinkage in size and activity of their adrenal glands. The adrenals lie near the kidneys and secrete a variety of hormones, among them those that we call the fight or flight hormones, adrenaline and noradrenaline, which influences an animal's quickness of response to perceived danger. And it continues on and explains how cats have been domesticated by humans and in all the different ways that that has affected us and it has affected them. Before it gets to the final chapter, which is about apples. The chapter opens up with a really funny quote I'd never heard before, but I like it. I don't, I didn't write it down in my notes or use it in my own life, but it says, a bad woman can't make good applesauce, an Ozark folk saying. And it expands upon how the apple, like corn, doesn't really have one distinct genetic ancestor that we can pinpoint, but that through context clues we can determine where it came from and what kind of climate it inhabited within that region. Some of the older apple trees from Kazakhstan, the ones growing in tight rows, bore fruit apples of different shapes, colors, and sizes. Some were nearly as big as those you see in the store, some were as small as crab apples. If the apples of Kazakhstan are indeed the offspring of the first and original Ur apple, God or perhaps some other agent made red, yellow, russet, purpley red, and splotchy in addition to green ones. The wild apple forests of Central Asia are at high altitudes. As a result, the trees are very hardy and do well in a short growing season. On that October day in Geneva, most of the fruit on the mature 
Malus Siaversi's trees was in fact past its prime. Phil cautioned as he handed me a medium-sized red apple to sample. It was no longer crisp and had a bland flavor, but still it was better than a red delicious. I don't know, that's a, that's an insult I don't like. But it does discuss how the development of apples for freshness and longer freshness has de deprived those breeds of sugar and of sweetness. It's discussed how that sweetness was necessary, how and why the apple tree spread, where it probably came from. Overall, this book is very fun to read. It does each of its chapters in kind of bite-sized portions. The um, first chapter is 36 pages, the following 40, the following 40, and the following 35. So it's not, it's not long sections, and they're interspersed with both scientific research and personal opinion as presented by the author. The full length of this book is 175 pages. I bought this used, I don't know for how much, I suspect only about six and a half dollars, but it was fun. It was something short and digestible that I could read while working for a summer camp. This book, if you're interested in learning about the science of bioengineering, I would really recommend it to you. If you're kind of into nature memoirs, I'd say uh, read it as well, but it is very niche in focus. As always, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another Used Book Rant.